Thank you very much. Welcome. I appreciate you sharing your dinner with us, and I hope we enlighten you uh, and give you some new insight in a very important topic. So the magnitude of the burden of, in, in this country is kind of obvious. Uh, you can see that, there is, that, that cardiovascular disease, particularly coronary heart disease, outstrips its next nearest competitors uh, when it comes down to attributing for mortality in this country. So I think we have no choice but to be very attentive to this entity. Problem comes, or how does this occur? The fact that there's 125 million people with high cholesterol, uh, 72 million people with elevated blood pressure, 50 million people with metabolic syndrome, then there's 21 million people who have diabetes and know about it, another 8 million people who are in for the surprise of their life when they find out about it, shake well, serve at room temperature, and someone dies every 30 seconds. About 50% of people who develop heart disease are missed with total cholesterol. 80% of the MI population had similar cholesterol levels as those who did not have an infarction. And the median LDL in our rather increasingly overweight country is 150 milligrams per deciliter. And as little as a quarter of premature coronary heart disease is attributed to elevated LDL cholesterol. Um, this is data from the Cleveland Clinic Group um, where they reported on individuals who were becoming candidates for cardiac transplantation. They did IVA studies on all these people and they found that about 15% of people under 20 and as over 60% of people under the age of 40 had significant coronary atheroma. And this is individuals who had normal angiograms. So it's clear that the absence of symptoms and even the absence of protruding atheroma into the coronary lumen does not necessarily identify someone who does not have atherosclerosis. And looking further at the data uh, that was generated in the early thrombinolytic studies that we were part of at NYU, is that more than 50% of people, I'm sorry, more than 68% of people have, uh, have plaques that are less than 50% in, in, in nature. So what that more or less means is that a, a reliable and responsible interventionist would not even think about intervening at one of these lesions and would be challenged to try to figure out why this person had a myocardial infarction. In this study, when a, a total of 17 uh, candidate biomarkers were assessed for their ability to raise the area under the curve uh, for incident coronary heart disease in the ERIC study, as you can see, many variables were, uh, were assessed. Only LPPLA2 was able to create a significant increase in the area under the curve uh, for this coronary event prediction in ERIC. Uh, these were all studies in which uh, LPPLA2 was assayed. In some of these trials, the uh, um, assay was performed after the clinical study was completed, uh, and all with a very consistent story that in a multivariate logistic regression analysis, that LPPLA2 was independently predictive of an increased risk for atherothrombotic events. Now, if you combine tertile of blood pressures, systolic blood pressures, with LPPLA2 level, you can see that the risk ratios for ischemic stroke go up dramatically. It's sort of an additive or a synergistic effect. As the blood pressure goes up and as the LPPLA2 level goes up, the risk factor for ischemic stroke goes up dramatically with risk ratios approaching seven when both of them are very high. Risk ratios approaching seven, which obviously is statistically relevant, but also very clinically relevant for this population of patients. In contrast to CRP, which is a marker of systemic inflammation and is produced by the liver in response to any one of a number of inflammatory conditions, LPPLA2 is a marker of vascular inflammation. It's produced by macrophages, it has minimal biovariability, and it's not affected by other inflammatory conditions. So the conclusions from Eric are that the LPPLA2 levels are higher in individuals who, who went on to suffer an ischemic stroke. These elevated levels conferred almost a two-fold risk for ischemic stroke regardless of the other risk factors. But when you combine them with other risk factors such as hypertension and elevated CRP, they have risk ratios of seven to 10 times normal. So here you can see that elevated LPPLA2 was significantly associated with both recurrent stroke and with a composite endpoint of stroke of mind, vascular death, compared to baseline. And again, here we see this magic hazard ratio of about 2.0. Interestingly, C-reactive protein, elevated CRP, 
really was not associated with an increased risk of recurrent stroke in this population with a hazard ratio, again, for the combined endpoint of about 1.0. So how do we use LPPLA2 as a diagnostic test in clinical practice? Uh, it has been FDA approved for use as a risk marker to pre predict risk of coronary heart disease events and stroke. Uh, one way that we might use this, and this is a, uh, a proposed guideline uh, that would en enable us or encourage us to use uh, a measurement of LPPLA2 with the, the plaque test in patients who are, again, at, as indicated by uh, earlier guidelines that I showed you, intermediate risk patients, those having two or more risk factors, and a 10-year risk, 10 to 20 percent, an intermediate risk, or perhaps selected groups of individuals with one risk factor that put them at high risk. As you can see, those patients, if plaque test was greater than 200 uh, nanograms per milliliter, milliliter, that is elevated, it would be reasonable to reclassify the patient into the next higher risk category with lowering of the LDL target, in this case in the intermediate risk, risk group, uh, to less than 100. In a higher risk population, those with established disease or risk equivalents or evidence of subclinical atherosclerosis by uh, non-invasive imaging, perhaps with a high PLA2, uh, an aggressive management strategy to lower their LDL to less than 70. And in patients with very high risk, uh, those with established uh, cardiovascular disease, multiple risk factors, uh, which could be poorly controlled or uh, recurrent, then a very aggressive, uh, with, with an elevated PLA2 level, a mandate for very aggressive intervention to control all metabolic risk factors, LDL, HDL, and triglycerides. Here's some, addi some additional examples of patients for whom LP, LPPLA2 testing may be useful. Uh, that are perhaps not well covered under the uh, traditional guidelines, those with positive family history only, but not traditional risk factors, uh, those with borderline LDL levels, but with at least one other traditional risk factor, an intermediate risk group, uh, those with optimal LDL levels, but with multiple uh, cardiovascular disease or stroke risk factors, uncon poorly controlled hypertension, for example, and in general, all patients in whom the aggressiveness of therapy needs to be determined those with borderline hypertension, mildly overweight, metabolic syndrome, uh, family history. What we see here displayed on this figure, which summarizes a number of recent data sets from pharmacological intervention trials, demonstrates that with the use of a number of commonly um, uh, uh, available lipid-lowering agents, ezetimibe, which is a cholesterol absorption inhibitor, statin therapy, uh, uh, fibrate therapy with phenofibrate, the combination of a statin, uh, and niacin, and omega-3 uh, fatty acids added to a statin, uh, reductions uh, uh, ranging from 18% to as much as 53% of LPPLA2 have been documented, which certainly suggests that uh, the beneficial effect of these lipid-modifying regimens uh, is certainly manifested to a great extent by reducing uh, plaque inflammation, which is so well um, assessed by levels of LPPLA2. So what about the formal FDA approval? Let's read it here. The Didexis plaque test is an immunoassay for the quantitative determination of LPPLA2 level in human plasma to be used in conjunction with clinical evaluation and patient risk assessment as an aid in predicting risk for coronary heart disease and ischemic stroke associated with atherosclerosis. And that really talks about a whole lot of patients. Let me conclude by saying that LPPLA2 is a sensitive and specific marker for stroke risk in a variety of patient populations. It appears to be more accurate and powerful than C-reactive protein. It's FDA approved for stroke risk, and it appears to be a treatable stroke risk factor. 